Another week, another recap. QQ on Mike and Johnny D pleasing the eyeballs. Let's open with the most confusing topic, airplay. So I tend to avoid discussing drama in my weekly recaps for a couple of reasons. First of all, I think that focusing on drama is unproductive. There are concrete and evidence-backed instances of journalistic impropriety out there, and you don't need to dip into the drama surrounding them in order to cover them. Second of all, and especially on social media, drama doesn't last long. What's dramatic this week is just forgotten next week. But this week, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to talk a little bit about the drama surrounding Airplay, which is a little disappointing for me because I thought that Airplay was gonna be relatively drama-free. So the first bit of news is that the committee was selected. Now keep in mind, these are not the people who are going to be speaking at Airplay. This is the committee that was chosen by Koretsky, and this committee will choose who will be speaking. One of the selection criteria to be on the committee was to not desire to be a committee member. The names on the committee are... Number one, William Usher. We all know who he is. He's a games journalist and one of the ones that was instrumental in revealing the truth about game journal pros. Number two, Alan Bakari. Most of us know who he is, too. He's a liberal libertarian journalist who previously wrote for TechCrunch and Spiked and now writes for Breitbart. He's been reporting on the Consumer Revolt for a good long while now, and I would describe his coverage as being pretty balanced, but definitely leaning pro. Full disclosure, I am moderately jealous of Mr. Bakari because he's younger than I am, and yet his writing skills put mine to absolute shame. Also, I think he's handsome. Anyway, number three, Dave Rickey. I had no idea who this was, and I have a feeling that most folks don't either, so I had to look it up. Apparently, he's a gaming industry veteran game designer who's worked for Verant Interactive, Mythic Entertainment, Mutable Realms, and Sony Online Entertainment. He did one of the interviews on The Escapist on the topic of Gamergate in the early days, and in it, he expresses a dislike for what he views as petty drama surrounding the event known as Gamergate, but also expresses an understanding of the anger that the consumers feel about being attacked by the gaming press. He also rejects the harassment harassment and misogyny angle, observing that core gaming is no more misogynistic than any other group of people, and he recognized that there's the presence of trolls stirring up shit. I would say that this is an odd but interesting choice. Finally, number four, John Smith. Nobody knew who he was, and that's where the first bit of drama comes in. Apparently, he's a young man who was quite interested in the Gamergate events and the Consumer Revolt, but wasn't particularly involved until he noticed Airplay, found Koretsky's phone number, and gave him a call. My suspicion as to why he was selected? I suspect that Koretsky is poking us. He wants to see how Gamergate reacts to certain stimuli. And one of the stimuli that he wanted to test was the insertion of an unknown party into what could be considered a position of power. So far, as I see it, the reaction has been to get John Smith on stream so that he can be interviewed and to demand transparency. I'll put a link in the description to a stream with Oliver Campbell, Koretsky, and John Smith. Now, as I go on, remember what I said about Koretsky and poking. The next bit of news is that Koretsky made updates on May 13th and 15th, and they're quite interesting. Koretsky is starting to talk to the anti-side to see if he can get them to show up. Now, what follows is my highly interpretive and subjective summary of what I think is happening. First of all, you might have noticed that I don't break Gamergate down into what I consider to be the false dichotomy of Gamergators and anti-Gamergators. I tend to describe Gamergate as an event consisting of a set of corruption scandals and a consumer revolt that resulted from them. I tend to describe anti-Gamergate as people who are opposed to discussing the scandals and who stand opposed to the revolt. And I think that putting it in these terms demonstrates how much of a challenge I think it will be to get these so-called antis to come to the table. They don't want to discuss Gamergate. To me, that seems like their one defining and unifying characteristic is that they don't want to discuss Gamergate. So what happened when Koreski sought them out and asked them to come to the table? From the sound of it, it sounds like they played the harassment card. They don't want to talk about Gamergate, they want to talk about the harassment. And in my view, I don't think that they really want to talk at all, which naturally leads them to claiming that they have safety concerns. So Koretsky came back with a familiar call to action. Hey, Gamergate, why don't you condemn harassment again? I mean, it's just to make your opponents feel safe. Well, as someone who does not participate in harassment, I guess it's time for me to condemn it yet again. I tell you what, I'll make a deal. Every time I'm asked to condemn harassment, I'll do it, but I'll also condemn waterboarding in the same breath. Hey, I'm a U.S. citizen, so if we're going to do this whole guilt by association thing, I'm as involved in one practice as I am the other. So yes, I condemn harassment and waterboarding. Both of these things are unpleasant, and both of them can make their victims fear for their safety. 
I don't believe that there's any circumstance under which harassment and waterboarding are acceptable, and I am wholeheartedly against both practices. Now that I got that over with, can we realize how messy it's going to be to try and debate people on a topic that they don't want to debate at all? Don't put all your eggs in the airplay basket, folks. I have a feeling that if anyone opposed to discussing Gamergate actually shows up, they'll be, well, opposed to discussing Gamergate, and will just try and derail to the harassment narrative whenever possible. So, more dig results came out last week. Username A Plant made a nice list of some Kickstarter accounts that various games journalists own, and Boogie Pop Robin did some digging into them. And sure enough, there was gold to be struck. Oh man, every time I see one of these polygonated faces, I just know that it's bound to be an ethical person, one that the consumers can trust. This one is Chris Grant, editor-in-chief of Polygon, who helped to kickstart the Ooya. You know, the Ooya, the Android-based video game console that completely dominated both the 7th and 8th console generations, and totally isn't up for sale right now due to being so deep in the hole. After the project was successfully funded, Grant wrote three articles on the Ooya without disclosure. One of the articles used that word again, darling, which is coincidentally the same word that Nathan Grayson used to describe Depression Quest. Oh look, another Polygon face. Now it's Michael McWerther, deputy news editor, giving money to Republic and planetary annihilation before writing about those multiple times without disclosure as well. And finally, wait, another Polygon face? <laughs> this is getting to be like a collectible card game. Potential financial conflicts of interest? Gotta catch them all, Polygon! This time it's Samet Sarkar, who contributed to the Kickstarter campaign for Pulse, and then went on to write two articles on it without disclosure. And there you have it, another three names for the freezer. And don't ever let yourself think that nobody is paying attention to Gamergate. Destructoid updated its disclosure policy a few days after the first of these Kickstarter disclosure issues was dug up. Chris Carter, review director for the site, added a paragraph about disclosing Kickstarter contributions. Thank you for doing the right thing, Carter. This is a topic that I feel the need to address this week in particular. Why? Well, first of all, people vocally opposed to discussing the Gamergate controversy seem to frequently exhibit this attitude with an exemplar tweet showing up this week. Second of all, the video podcast Extra Credits released a video discussing the upcoming game by Destructive Creations called Hatred. Now I know, I know, what does this have to do with ethics and games journalism? Well, I'm of the opinion that the issue of censorship and banning is tangled up in the Gamergate controversy too, and you can address it without ever bringing up the topic of SJWs. I mean, do you think that this whole thing would have exploded in the way that it did if it wasn't for private censorship? So let me rant for a bit. So let's go back to this tweet. It looks a little absurd at first. I mean, the individual is arguing that they are against censorship, but in favor of banning. How is this logically consistent? Well, it all depends on how you define these things. In this tweet, all one has to do to make it logically consistent is assume that censorship can only be done by governments, and that banning is something done by private entities. A good example of this is lewd games. I love me some lewd games, but while the government does not censor them, they are banned from just about all storefronts and payment processors. Go ahead and try and sell a lewd game on Steam. Valve's gonna make you alter the contents. Why not just put it on your own website and sell it with PayPal? Well, I hope you like having your PayPal account suspended. It's actually quite a challenge to find a payment processor that will allow you to sell lewd games, with companies like Honeypot coming up with creative ways to get their games on storefronts like Steam. A more historical example would be the Comics Code Authority. For quite some time between the 1950s and 2000s, if your comic didn't have this cute little seal on it, almost no distributors would carry it. And to get this cute seal, you needed to follow strict guidelines. No excessive violence, no zombies, no disrespect for authority figures like policemen, judges, or politicians. There are even restrictions on how you could use certain words, like the word crime. Heck, it even tried to enforce good grammar. And all this was not done by the government. The Comics Code Authority was part of an industry trade group. It was created in response to a moral panic that believed that comics had a pernicious effect on their readers. So this would be considered banning of content, but not censorship by some. I personally think that that's an odd line in the sand to draw. And I mean, we could argue all day about definitions of the word censorship, but I would still argue in favor of little to no content restrictions being placed by distributors. And that brings us to Extra Credit's video on hatred. What happened to you guys? I used to be a big fan. Let me try to quickly break down their argument. Basically, they say that this game, Hatred, is centered around sadism, the desire to hurt people. 
while this in itself is disputable, with Destructive Creations itself disputing this in the comments, let's run with this for now. Their argument proceeds to say that since the game is only about indulging sadism, it has no redeeming value that this game offers little more than titillation for sadists. The conclusion is that while destructive creations have a right to free speech and all that, Extra Credits fully supports the rights of, and I would say encourages, private companies not to sell the game. This argument structure is very familiar, and it can sound very convincing, and it's so tried and true that actual government restrictions on speech have been created based around similar logic. Have you heard of the Miller Test? It's a set of three questions that are asked to determine if a work is obscene and therefore not deserving of First Amendment protection in the U.S. Here's the checklist to determine if something's obscene. Number one, whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find the work taken as a whole appeals to prurient interests. Number two, whether the work depicts or describes, in a patently offensive way, sexual conduct or excretory functions. And number three, whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. Thankfully, that third criteria ensures that even most pornography is not illegal. Now let me contrast how similar the argument that Extra Credits is making is to this very convincing and historically successful one. I mean, we can almost just swap out the sexy words for violent ones. Their argument is that this work, according to contemporary standards and when taken as a whole, appeals to sadistic interest, that it describes or depicts in a patently offensive way violent or sadistic conduct, and finally that it lacks any redeeming value. If there was a Miller test for violence and sadism, Extra Credits would basically be arguing that this game fails, and therefore it should not be sold by private entities. Again, currently there thankfully is no Miller test for violence, but this is a tried and true argumentative style that is very convincing to people who have views on free speech similar to those seen in this tweet here. So that's my views on that argument and why I think it's a shameful and manipulative one. It's exploiting thought patterns that lead to moral panics and lead to private enforcement of speech codes and things like the Comics Code Authority. And anytime I see an argument like that being made, I'm gonna tear it down, wherever it crops up. For me, it's obvious that declaring that hatred has no redeeming value is an absurd claim. It started a considerable amount of social commentary about it, so there's value right there. And it's really hard to argue that it has no artistic value. I mean, I know that both Piss Christ and Duchamp's Fountain have clear artistic value you, so it's clear to me that hatred does as well. It has art potential in the visuals, in its mechanics, in how it makes the player feel or react, so I reject this argument wholeheartedly. And that doesn't even touch the misuse of the word sadism. And that's all I have time for this week. Remember, subscriptions and retweets are a YouTuber's lifeblood. Join us again next time for more fun shenanigans. Ciao!